The African American Historic Property Survey exists because around 2003, 2004, we felt the need to better document uh, that portion of our community. Historic preservation in Phoenix started in the 1980s, and around that time, the focus was really on high-style architecture, big, fancy buildings, things that people recognized and knew, and we realized that by focusing on these buildings, we were really telling a story that was about um, white people, <laughs> and specifically rich white people in the buildings that they built and created. And the history that we were telling was not telling the history of everyone in Phoenix. We wanted to make sure that we were capturing the history uh, of others. We knew that there were uh, minorities, that there were African Americans, Hispanics, Asian Americans, and others whose histories were not being told. And so the point of this survey was to go back, kind of regroup and figure out who are we missing? Who do we need to focus on and make sure that everyone's story was told the way it deserved to be told? The survey was completed in October of 2004. It took about a year to complete. And the purpose of the survey was just to compile a history of African Americans in Phoenix from the time Phoenix was founded up until about 1970. And um, you know, the people that worked on it did archival research, they did questionnaires to the African American community, they recorded oral histories, and um, they basically went around the community and just trying to compile information from various sources. And the purpose of it was to try to figure out which properties were still there that had an association with African-American history and which might be eligible for listing on either the Phoenix Historic Property Register or the National Register of Historic Places. The consultant that worked on the survey was Athenaeum Public History Group. The two principal historians for that firm were David Dean and Gene Reynolds, who had both worked with our office on various projects before. And they were assisted by other historians um, from ASU, from the Arizona Historical Society, and folks from the community who were very key in terms of getting people involved in the survey, getting information, and they really did a fantastic job. My name is Lawrence Hillman, and I was uh, born in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, my name is Gail Hillman Sr., and as, as uh, far as I know, I'm not exactly sure of the year, but I imagine it was somewhere back in the early 40s. My father's family came here from the Branchville, Branchville, Texas area. My mother and her family migrated out here about the same time from the Crockett, Texas area. Okay, my name is Charles R. Johnson. Uh, I came out here, well, see, I, myself and my mother came out in 50, about well, 51. My, my dad's older sister, she came, I think they came out here in 32. Okay, I was actually born here in the city of Phoenix and uh, I was born in the old Maricopa County Hospital when it used to be back on 35th Avenue in Durango where the jailhouse is. Uh, my mom and uh, my brothers and the sisters, I'm the youngest of six, but my mom and uh, my brothers and sisters, we moved to California when I was in the second or third grade. So, and then I came back out here in 1974, uh, when I came back out here after I got out of school. And then uh, I went to OIC and they started the RUMP program. And uh, Don Alfred talked me into uh, studying to be a police officer. They was paying a stipend of $91 a week. My family came to Phoenix in 1921. And my uh, great grandfather was, uh, was a sharecropper in Texas. And he had some issues with the uh, property owner and uh, he had a friend here in Arizona. And the friend said, well, why don't you come out to Phoenix and the cotton prices are better and the bosses were a little bit easier on people. So he picked up the whole family, uh, including my grandmother and my dad. And they all came out in 1921. Okay, I'm a native Texan. 
came from Dallas, Fort Worth. And when I came, I thought uh, Arizona was just a little bit backwards because I was not used to, uh, you know, one street going all the way and not stopping or making a detour. So that threw me off. And I was, I was used to a big metropolitan area. And when I went downtown, it was like, okay, this was a 10 minute trip. Uh, back in the 70s, there was not a lot of growth. And I saw a lot of old, I saw a lot of abandoned buildings. And I, I was kind of like, okay. So then when I started uh, exploring the neighborhood and meeting people at my church, and that got me interested in the area where my church was, because at that time there were more African African Americans living in that area. My name is Charles Floyd Brewer. I was born in Raleigh, Tennessee, but I was actually born in Memphis because at that point when I was born in 1948, the African Americans only had the county house part of the go to, and that was in Memphis. So that's how it started. My I grew up in a two-room schoolhouse till the sixth grade. My mom left in 1956 because she had had enough. There was a hanging of one of our relatives on a sharecropper farm, and they let him stay there. My mom said she had to leave. So that's a little background on how and why my mom left. She left in 1956. I stayed with my grandparents, Mary and Frank Hall. In 1959, my mom had a job and a house. And at that point, she brought me out. So that's the beginning. What we found in the survey is that there are three main focus areas where African Americans lived in Phoenix historically. The first is what we know as the East Lake Park neighborhood today, and it's on the east side of downtown from about 7th to 16th streets along Washington and Jefferson streets. And then on the west side, um, there was a concentration around the Matthew Henson public housing project near 7th Street and Buckeye, really extending as far west as 19th Avenue and down to I-17 on the south. And then there was a third area on the south side of town, what we kind of know as South Phoenix today, just south of the river around Broadway to Rozier and from about 16th Street over to 24th Street. And then there was another area just east of that called Okima, all the way over around University and 40th Streets. When I was born, I was born in uh, Matthew Henson Projects uh, on 7th Avenue in Tonto. And uh, around 1950, we moved to the east side on uh, 17th Street in Madison. My dad built the home there. And so, uh, and spent the rest of my, my uh, childhood and, and teen years uh, living on, uh, on the east side. The first known African-American resident in Phoenix was Mary Green, and she arrived in Phoenix in 1868. She was a servant who worked with the Columbus Gray family, and the Gray family had a homestead that was down near 7th Street and Buckeye Road. Uh, most of the early African-Americans who were in Phoenix came from southern states, although others came from Kansas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, there was a, a mix, but many of them did come from the South. We know from the census information that there were not a lot of African American residents here early on. In fact, the number is consistently between about 3% and 6% during the first three decades of the 20th century. The numbers were very few. Interestingly, the ones that did live here in Phoenix, many of them owned their own homes. And that was something I didn't realize until we did the survey and uncovered that information. Um, around 1920, the percentage of home ownership for African Americans in Phoenix was around 75%. That's a very impressive number and one that I don't think a lot of us knew. My grandmother, she, she paid for that property on 940 East Monroe. And then my father and my mother, they bought a brand new home in South Phoenix in the 
part of self development. And as far as going out the other side of Van Buren and MacDowell, Fox just knew that we weren't supposed to be out there then at that time. So in the late 19th century, when African Americans first come to Phoenix, uh, most of them live right in the original town site, and particularly on the southeast portion of the town site, so south of Washington Street and east of Central, right around the area where Chase Field is today, uh, right around Fifth Street and Madison. In fact, we know that's where the first African American school was located, and a number of churches were in that area as well. Over time, during the first couple decades of the 20th century, they started moving a little bit further east uh, across 7th Street into what is today known as the East Lake Park neighborhood. As that neighborhood started to develop, it became uh, a real haven for African-American residents in Phoenix. One of the factors that affected where people lived in Phoenix was flooding. And in the 1890s, there was a series of floods, the Salt River, there was no dam at that point. Roosevelt Dam wasn't built until 1911. And so prior to that time, uh, there was quite a bit of flooding along the Salt River. And in the 1890s, there were floods that came as far north into the Phoenix town site as Washington and Jefferson Streets. And so anybody who could afford to left the south part of town and moved further north, uh, up along uh, McDowell and, and Thomas, even, even that far north uh, during the early 20th century. Unfortunately, the folks who could not afford to move got left behind in the south part of town, and that was most of our minorities and other poor white residents. Uh, the Okima area, which was around 40th Street and University, was a largely rural area. It was subdivided in the 1920s, but the lots were very large, and there was a lot of farming that took place in that area. But it was another location where African Americans uh, grew and, and lived during the early 20th century. So as Phoenix started to grow during the late 19th century, we see African-American businesses that start to pop up. Uh, many of the early businessmen in Phoenix who were African-American uh, were barbers or beauticians or printers, embalmers, and there were even two hotels that were run by African-Americans in Phoenix. A couple of the prominent businessmen during that time were William P. Crump, who ran a hay and grain company, and Frank Shirley, who ran the fashion barber shop. Uh, Crump and Shirley in particular were well-known and very respected members of the early Phoenix community. So during the, the teens, we start to see African-American newspapers become popular, as many of the African-American stories are not being related in the mainstream newspapers. So there are African-Americans who decide to start their own newspapers. One of these was uh, the Phoenix Tribune, which was started by Arthur Smith. And then the Arizona Gleam was also started by Ira Hackett, who was an African-American woman. The African-American churches played a, an important role in early Phoenix. Pretty much everybody went to church back then, and the church was the center of social life for many African-Americans in Phoenix. One of the earliest churches that was established in Phoenix was the Tanner Chapel AME Church. It was established in 1887. And the building is still there at 8th Street in Jefferson today. Uh, we also know that the first institutional Baptist church was founded in the uh, early 20th century, as well as the Lucy Phillips CME Church. A few of the churches that existed historically are still there and have been listed on both the Phoenix Register and the National Register of Historic Places. In fact, the Tanner Chapel AME Church was listed as a landmark on the Phoenix Register to denote that it's exceptionally significant. The Lucy Phillips Memorial Church has also been listed on the Phoenix Register. Uh, I was baptized, I think I was nine years old at Pilgrim Rest Baptist Church now there. It's west of uh, 14th Street on Jefferson. I was there every Sunday, uh, whatever door, whatever time the doors through the week. But my mother, she, she kept us in church, so I was at church most of the time, but every Sunday, that was you. My grandmother made me go to church every Sunday. And uh, I used to go to church and I had one suit <laughs> and it really wasn't a suit. It was a 
coat and uh, some pants, and uh, it was a tweed coat. And in Arizona, you can imagine how it was. But all the other kids would be out playing ball and stuff like that, having fun. And here I would go marching off to church every Sunday. And uh, I guess that's why I hate church today. <laughs> I attended church at First Institutional Baptist Church. And that was on a, uh, it was on the east side, of, I don't know, 13th in Jefferson or something like that. But I used to have to go every Sunday. It was Phillips Memorial Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. It uh, originally started on 7th Street, in, uh, Jefferson in 1909. Uh, but then in 1947, moved to uh, Adams and, and 14th Street. That was my, um, that, that is still my home church. I still go there. I've seen the growth in, in Phoenix. There are other churches that were founded on the west side of town and on the south side of town. The Grace Baptist Church was one. The Shiloh Baptist Church was another. That was on the west side. And then of course the Willow Grove Baptist Church was in the Okima area. My uh, both grandparents, on both sides, and my mother, and father, even my Aunt Nancy. She would take she would take us to church sometime during the week with them for the prayer meetings and and whatever else was going on during the week. But then every Sunday, my grandmother, my Mama Lillian, that's my father's mother. She made sure she would go to the Salvation Army or some secondhand place and make sure we had something nice to wear to church on Sundays. So yes, we were, were definitely raised up in the church. And the church we attended was First Institutional Baptist. That was on my father's side. And then we'd be with my mother's with my mother's parents sometime, we would go to Willow Grove Church that was located in the Okima area of Phoenix at that time. In 1909, the Arizona Territorial Legislature passed a law approving school segregation and specifically segregating African-American children from white children. Uh, there were people who challenged this. In fact, uh, Governor Joseph Kibbe vetoed the law. He didn't think it was fair. He thought that it was unfair that African-Americans should have to go to a different school than white children. And so he vetoed the law. Unfortunately, the legislature overrode his veto and the law became established. There was a plaintiff, an African-American by the name of Samuel Bayless, who filed suit. He challenged it in court. And in fact, after Governor Kibbe um, was no longer governor, he, uh, Bayless hired Kibbe to represent him in court. Kibbe was the lawyer who, who argued the case, and they argued it for about two years. It worked its way to the Arizona Supreme Court, but unfortunately, in the end, it was upheld and segregation became the law of the land here in Arizona. There were segregated schools in Phoenix historically, so after the territorial legislature approved segregation, the first segregated school opened in 1910. And this was the Franklin Douglas School that was at Fifth Street in Madison. And then following that school, there was another one in East Lake that opened. It was called the East Lake School in 1924. And then in 1928, the Booker T. Washington School was open. These were all on the east side of town. And the Booker T. Washington School was a big, large school. It was beautiful, but it was segregated. When the Booker T. Washington School opened in 1928, it basically replaced the Douglas School and the East Lake School. It was a very large school. It was built at a cost of $110,000, designed by the prominent architectural firm of Lesher and Mahoney, who had designed many other buildings in Arizona. And so it was beautiful. The architecture was really grand. Like many schools, Booker T. Washington School played an important role in the African-American community. It was a real uh, focal point and a social gathering place. The building is still there today. It continued operating as a school until 1984. Then it finally closed and it has been adaptively reused. And it's now the office for the New Times and for V Digital Services.
Another segregated school from the 1920s that still exists today is the Dunbar Elementary School, which is located at 9th Avenue and Grant Street. And it was an important focal point uh, near the Matthew Henson community on the west side of town. Uh, it was also a segregated school, but it's still in use today as a school and is one of three buildings that remains from that era. Uh, many of these buildings have been listed on the Phoenix Historic Property Register and National Register of Historic Places. Both Booker T. Washington and Dunbar are on the Phoenix Register, and Dunbar is on the National Register of Historic Places. So in 1910, the elementary school students in Phoenix were segregated. And then in 1914, the high school students became segregated as well. Uh, Phoenix Union High School voters held an election and they approved segregation of the high school student population. And so starting later that year, high school students met in the basement of uh, Phoenix Union High School if they were African American. The white students met in the regular classrooms. The uh, African American students were forced to meet in the basement. And this continued for a while, and then eventually there became so many African American students that they had to move to a new location. So they met in a house in the East Lake Park neighborhood for a while. By 1926, there were 80 students meeting in one house. <laughs> it was clear there was not enough room, and so the school district realized they needed to build a new building. And that's when um, the Phoenix Union Colored High School was built in 1926. There were some issues within the community when the Phoenix Union Colored High School site was selected. Um, to try to save costs, the school district selected a site that was basically a city dump. It was in an industrial area near 4th and Grant Streets, and many of the African American parents protested and said they didn't want their children to have to travel to that area or go to school in that area. It was not a desirable area, but unfortunately uh, they lost out on the protest and the school was built on that site. So just like everything else in Phoenix during the early 20th century, hospitals were also segregated. A black patient could not necessarily be treated at a white hospital by a white doctor. And so seeing the need for health care among the African American community, Dr. Winston Hackett arrives in Phoenix in 1916. And then a few years later, he opened the first hospital for African Americans, which was the Booker T. Washington Hospital. It was just down the street from Booker T. Washington Elementary School in the East Lake Park neighborhood. And the hospital grew quickly. It became uh, very popular and served many, many African American residents for decades. To assist with the hospital effort, Dr. Hackett recruited nurses who were very well trained and highly educated from the South. And he was able to get them to come to Phoenix to staff the hospital. And the hospital won praises from many, not just in the African American community, but in the white community as being one of the best run in the country. Over time, additional African American doctors came to Phoenix and became more established. These include uh, Dr. N.B. Greenlee and Dr. A. McDonald, along with Dr. Foster. And there were also dentists that practiced in the early Phoenix community who were African American, Dr. Lowell Wormley and uh, Dr. Crump, who was the son of William P. Crump. Okay, my mother was a nurse's aide. And she was employed by the county hospital. And she worked there for, I don't know how many years, forever as far as I know. <laughs> so it seemed like forever. But uh, she was a nurse's aide and uh, quite a chore taking care of seven kids with her income, but she uh, she managed, you know, here I am today. And in spite of the hardships and difficulties that African Americans faced in early Phoenix, they did find time for recreation and leisure. There were clubs and fraternal organizations that were very popular, very active during uh, early Phoenix. And also um, there were parks that were frequented by African Americans. Irvine Park um, near 9th Avenue and Grant was one that was very popular from about 1919 to 1923. And then of course, uh, Grant Park was another one on the south side of town that was very popular. The biggest one, however, was East Lake Park at 16th Street in Jefferson. And it's still even today associated with the African American community in Phoenix. After African Americans began to move to the East Lake Park neighborhood during the early 20th century, East Lake Park itself became an important gathering place. In fact, it was really the place where people in that neighborhood went 
to socialize and to recreate. There were also important protests and speaking events that took place at East Lake Park over the years. One of the first took place in 1909, and that is the place where there was the first uh, local celebration of the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation from President Lincoln back in the 1860s. In 1911, Booker T. Washington came to Phoenix and he spent three days here. And all three days he spoke at East Lake Park and there were crowds that came to hear him and it was very well attended. So starting in 1921, Emancipation Day or Juneteenth, as it was called, was celebrated at East Lake Park. Also at East Lake Park, starting in 1925, uh, there was a picnic held by the Arizona Republic for African-American children. And this was a very popular annual event that took place up through World War II. East Lake would be number one. I mean, without a doubt, the East Lake Park, because you had everything that you wanted, ever wanted to do, you know, in terms of sports. They had dances in the canteen. Uh, they had, that's where you could meet girls. And of course, you know, that was it. But as a kid, it, it was, as a kid and a preteen, it was definitely East Lake Park. Uh, we had a swimming pool. My cousin, uh, Kenny Grimes, was a, a lifeguard. He started a, a swim team. We had one of the finest swim teams in Phoenix. I mean, we had, I mean, I can name Bernal Blunt, uh, Gary Pratt, uh, Howard Pratt, um, Butch McGee. We went all over town. We went to Grand Park, we went to Harmon Park, we went to Elkhart Park, we went to Encanto Park. And we kicked butt our swimming team up. I mean, we had stretches in the backstroke, the breaststroke, freestyle. I mean, we were, we had some fine, fine athletes. I, I, I kid you not. As a matter of fact, uh, the story should be written. We, we had a fine swim team. So, and of course, we gymnasium, we play basketball. Some of us played baseball out on the baseball park. So East Lake, East Lake had it all for us, you know. When we were growing up, East Lake Park, Muhammad Ali would come to the park probably once every other year because they had a Muslim home uh, retreat on the south side. So he'd come down to East Lake Park and just hang out with the guys. Now I want you to imagine you're a freshman, sophomore, eighth grader, any of those, and you're at the park, and here comes Muhammad Ali in there. Tremendous, tremendous impact on our lives. Now, Zorro Foley trained right by our federal housing. There was a gym there on the corner of 17th Street in Washington. Zorro Foley trained there to get ready to fight Muhammad Ali. See, that's a good story. That's a good story. So as the stock market crashes in 1929 and the depression takes hold, we start to see a number of changes here in Phoenix, and particularly with the African-American community. There's a great influx of African-American residents during this time. There are many people from the South, but particularly from states such as Oklahoma and Texas, where the Dust Bowl became a big deal and people were poverty stricken. They left those states and came to places like Arizona where they could hopefully find a better life. And so we see the population of African-Americans in Phoenix increase during this time. Uh, by 1940, African-Americans represented 7% of the population, which was a big jump over the 4% that they'd represented previously. So during the Depression, as you might expect, the percentage of home ownership among African-Americans fell drastically. Whereas in the 1920s, it was up near 75%. By the 40s and 50s, it had fallen uh, well below 50% and there were many African-Americans who lived in poverty. Part of the reason why African-Americans had such difficulty owning homes and buying homes during this time is that there was dis discrimination in lending. Uh, many of the realty groups identified minority neighborhoods as hazardous, and banks refused to provide loans to people who wanted to buy or build in these areas. And so the poorer areas of Phoenix, which were predominantly on the south side of town,
became even poorer during this time. So by the end of the 1930s, the slum conditions had become so bad that something had to be done. There were many reports, uh, newspaper reports and other things going on during that time that called the south part of Phoenix the, the shame of Phoenix. It was really deplorable, the conditions that were there. And of course, many of the folks who lived there were African American. Uh, one of the people who decided to do something about it was a white priest by the name of Emmett McLaughlin. And Father Emmett, as he was called by his congregation, he was assigned to um, a parish on the south side of town. And he decided that in addition to being a priest, he also wanted to be a champion for safe and affordable housing for people who did not have anything better to turn to. And so he formed a group that became known as the Phoenix Housing Project and he was relentless. He's kind of a controversial figure because he eventually left the priesthood, but he was a strong, strong advocate for public housing and for affordable housing, particularly among Phoenix's African-American and Mexican-American communities. Well, McLaughlin managed to convince the state legislature to pass an act in 1939 that would allow for public housing projects in Arizona. And shortly after that time, the Phoenix Housing Authority was created and uh, McLaughlin became a key figure with that housing authority. Um, there was a $1.6 million allocation given to Phoenix for public housing, and that led to the building of three separate public housing projects. Of course, this being 1939, 1940, they were segregated. And one of those was the Matthew Hansen public housing project that was built at 7th Avenue in Sherman, which was, uh, again, specifically for black residents. Um, the Marcos Denisa public housing project and Frank Luke project were for Mexican-Americans and Anglos, respectively. Well, let's put it like this. For, I won't speak for the Hispanic population, but for the African-American population, we couldn't buy a home north of Thomas Road. And the, and the example of that is Mr. Lincoln Ragsdale, who is the pillar within the African-American community, outstanding businessman, political activist. He did the things that helped us get more rights, but he had to have one of his friends who was Caucasian to buy him a house on the north side of Thomas by Encano School, by Encano Park, in order for him to get a house on Thomas. And that was not met with a lot of favor at the time. But once the transaction had went through, there was nothing they could do about it. So from the 1940s, really until the present day, the Matthew Henson Public Housing Project played an important role for the African-American community on the west side of town. It was really the center of the community where people lived and met and socialized in that area. The original public housing project is now gone. It was demolished several years ago and replaced with the Matthew Henson Apartments. But there is a small courtyard from the original project that still remains and was listed on the Phoenix Historic Property Register. It's currently vacant, but it will be adaptively reused. Uh, you know, I was the youngest of six kids. We lived over on Monroe, then we moved over there to 27th Avenue behind the Capitol. It was right about the time when they were uh, building the uh, I-17 freeway and then uh, actually, when I came back out here and got on the city council, uh, it was actually doing while I was on the city council that we approved this study to be done that uh, I learned more about the history of the African American community and the impacts of, of what they had and being downtown and the property that was on downtown and the areas and more of the his history, which is one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that, you know, we have that, that history in the African American community that's actually being recorded just not talking about the parks but also talking about you know the areas that people uh, actually lived and grew up in and one of the reasons why you know when you look on the uh, west side and some of those areas like east lake park one of the things that was important about it, about east lake park but you had the projects over there that's why you have a swimming pool over there because it was actually those projects were actually built for minorities then when you come to the west side you have uh, elkai park you have grant park uh, which all of those parks, you don't have any other areas in the city of Phoenix.
that has city crews like that, but they all are really basically in what was really predominantly minority communities where minority people live. So they built those things there so that they would have it, but also to make sure that they didn't uh, they didn't really go into other places in the city. You know, there was uh, a still property on record back then that uh, property that was north of Van Buren could not be sold to minorities. And so those were, were things that have to be dealt with. But when you look at the layout, although a lot of it's changing, that the housing projects that you have uh, with Matthew Henson, where we built Henson Village at over there, uh, that was one of the areas. You had Luke Crone projects, you had all of those projects, but they were really built for uh, minorities and the farm workers. And that's where many of the people lived until they did open up uh, housing. They opened up housing over there off of uh, uh, 17th Avenue and uh, just south of Buckeye, and then it started to to open up. But really, all the African Americans and Hispanics really, from that time period, all really grew up around each other because that's the only place they could live. Our neighborhood was fine, and I was not disappointed where I was at. I was not ashamed of living in federal housing. I was not ashamed of getting uh, the food. Uh, for a while, my mom was on welfare, but her welfare allowed all of us to eat. And eventually, like I say, for her to go back and get her uh, LPN license so she could work. So the only thing I saw was opportunities to expand. So World War II happens during the 1940s, and many African-Americans in Phoenix are called to service to fight for their country. They return home uh, after the war ends in 1945, and they find that things are still the way they were before. There's segregation, discrimination, and um, they're limited as far as where they can live. It's very, very sad because they fought you know, with white servicemen for their country and then come home and unfortunately find conditions the same as when they left. Uh, around this time, we start to see some new housing developments pop up, particularly in South Phoenix. And the Okima area, in particular around 40th Street and University Drive, is one where we see some new subdivisions platted. But the area around 20th Street and Broadway is really where the focus is for African American development during this time. There's a group called the Progressive Builders Association that decides that they're going to take it upon themselves to buy land and to do housing developments for African Americans because they really don't have any other place to go. And so the Progressive Builders Association buys the land, spearheads the development, and then there's a contracting firm by the name of Williams and Jones who does the building. And the reason why they were successful during this time is because they were able to get VA and FHA loans. The government provided backing that private banks were willing to do up until this time, but with the VA and FHA loans, they were successful. The Carlotta Place subdivision was at 19th Street and Broadway, and it was developed by Dr. Robert Phillips and his wife, Louisa. Interestingly, Louisa was the president of the NACP, and she was very involved in the school desegregation movement in Phoenix. The churches continued to be an important force during the 30s, 40s, and 50s into the post-war era. Churches established in Phoenix during this time include Pilgrim Rest Missionary Baptist Church in 1930, St. Monica's Mission, later known as St. Pius X Church in 1936, Wesley Methodist Church in 1946, and Greater Friendship Missionary Baptist Church in 1949. During the post-World War II era, African-American businesses continued to expand in Phoenix. Madge Copeland ran a very popular beauty shop from the 1930s through the 1960s. Lincoln Ragsdale ran a mortuary starting in 1947 that became very, uh, very popular. And of course, Ragsdale would go on to become one of the key figures during the Civil Rights Movement. There was also a movie theater called the West Side Theater that was owned by and catered to African-Americans on the west side of town. And then there were more newspapers during this time, including the Phoenix Index and Arizona Sun that had an African-American clientele. My mother was pretty brave. She put up some money to open up a restaurant on 16th Street in Jefferson, right next to uh, Reddish Quarter. And it was a barbecue restaurant. 
and it was called Joanne. Her name was Joanne. It was called Joanne and Sons. So that was me and my brother, who were the sons. And so we had it for about a year, year and a half. And you know, she 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 uh, was a, she was an excellent excellent cook, but she wasn't didn't have the really business acumen to, to really make it go. You know, plus we had some pretty stiff competition with Hodges Barbecue down, you know, two couple blocks down, and Town Hall Barbecue a few blocks down on 13th Street. But it was a uh, shows you that. Uh, what you could do, you know, if you if you were dedicated and strong enough to try it out, and she was, you know, yeah. And I was too young; I was only 12 years old. Like, all I could do was drink soda and and you know, bring in the wood, you know, yeah. The barber shops were uh, part of the black community. We had Stubbs Barber Shop, which was around 16th in Washington. Then we had Mr. Mann's Barber Shop, which was around 12th in Washington. We would always usually have some barbecue from Hodges Barbecue, which was located around 10th in Washington. And what I do remember about that was this. At that time, we had to go to the back of the restaurant and ring a bell to get service. I just thought that was normal for, you know, takeoff. Later I found out it was because we were black, we weren't allowed to go in the front door. There was Mrs. White, she's still there. There was Hodges Barbecue that is no longer there. Uh, and I have a whole list of, uh, there was beauty salons there. At that time it was Adrian's Beauty Salon, Knox Barbershop, uh, quite a few, uh, areas to eat, uh, small restaurants. Uh, there were some Hispanics uh, restaurants, and of course there was uh, Asian restaurants, but uh, mainly uh, I, I supported and mainly uh, connected with the African-American businesses. And there were con construction companies and, you know, things like that. So following World War II, schools in Phoenix were still segregated. African Americans still attended their own schools. And during this time, new schools were built. A new school opened in Okima. It was known as the Okima or 40th Street School. Another school opened near 20th Street and Broadway, the Percy L. Julian School. It opened in 1946. And another school opened in 1947, the Bethune School, near 15th Avenue in Pima. Despite the segregation that continued following World War II, the African-American schools really became a point of pride. And Carver High School in particular was one that many people were very proud of. The name was changed in 1943. It was originally Phoenix Union Colored High School, but they changed the name to honor George Washington Carver. And from that point forward, it became known as Carver High School. In 1945, there was a new principal at Carver, W.A. Robinson and he was determined to make Carver the finest school in the country. He recruited teachers from other parts of the country, but particularly from the South, who held master's degrees. And so the faculty at Carver was among the best educated in the country. He refused to accept secondhand or cast off items from the white schools and was a, a strong force making Carver the best it could be. Some of the teachers that Robinson recruited were Arlena Seneca, Betty Fairfax, Gussie Wilson, Alice Marriott, Maddie Hackett Moore, and Thelma Shaw. And many of these individuals would go on to be important people in the community. Healthcare continues to be an important issue for African Americans during the post-war era. It starts to change with the efforts of Father Emmett McLaughlin. In 1937, he created a maternity clinic that was known as St. Monica's Maternity Clinic. And a few years later, 1944, he establishes a hospital known as St. Monica's Hospital. It later is renamed Phoenix Memorial Hospital and still exists today. Father Emmett also established a nursing school called St. Monica's Nursing School. And it became one of the leading nursing schools in the country and received international acclaim for the fact that there were white nurses and black nurses working side by side and training together. Uh, some of the parks in the community that were important to African-Americans during this time were Grant Park, 
Harmon Park, and of course Riverside Park. Riverside was interesting. It was on Central Avenue, just north of the Salt River. And there were days that were set aside for African-Americans to go there. There were other days that were set aside for whites. Um, they had a ballroom that was very popular with all races. And interestingly, some of the big names played there. In fact, uh, Count Basie and Louis Armstrong both played in Phoenix at the Riverside Ballroom during the same week. Another important person during this time was John Ford Smith, who played with the Negro Baseball Leagues. In fact, he's the only Arizonan that we know played in the leagues. And he was a pitcher with the Kansas City Monarchs and was fairly successful. So East Lake Park continued to be an important gathering place for African Americans during the 30s, 40s, and into the 50s. In fact, there were several demonstrations that took place at East Lake Park, including a demonstration of protesting the arrest of the Scottsboro Boys and other discriminating acts that were taking place in the world throughout that time. We we had we would we would form uh, as a group at East Lake Park. Particularly around 1963, 1964, during the uh, marches and the demonstrations for public accommodations, we would march from there down to the Capitol, and um, we have speeches by Mr. You know Lincoln Ragsdale and and, and several others, uh, Reverend Brooks, um, and but East Lake was the point, you know, and I didn't know at the time that there had always been the focal point for folks in our, blacks in our community. You know, when there was an issue that came up, they would meet at East Lake Park. Uh, when Booker T. Washington came to Phoenix in 1915, I think around 1920, he, he spoke at East Lake Park, you know? So that history goes back and it, and it, and it was also for us as well, not just the, the uh, baby boomers, but for the the generation, the great generation as well, you know, before us, you know, my dad used to hang out at East Lake Park. You know, I was speaking with a woman named uh, Marianne Coleman, and I interviewed her back in 2011, and she lived over on the West Side, on Ninth Avenue and Tonto, Eleventh Avenue, near near Buckeye Road, and she said that. She, her and her friends would walk over to Jefferson Street at the Capitol and catch the trolley and go all the way to East Lake Park because that's where the trolley stopped, that 16th Street. And then they would go dance. This was like in the late 30s, early 40s. They would dance over at East Lake Park, but their mothers would be sitting there on top of the amphitheater, you know, just to keep an eye on them, you know. And so that's the kind of a place that East Lake was. It, it drew everybody in the community. Yeah. During this time, clubs and fraternal organizations continued to play an important role in the African American community. One of the most important was the Elks Lodge that was created in 1922 and later became known as the William Patterson Elks Lodge. The current building was built in 1946. It's located near 7th Avenue in Buckeye. Joining the Elks Lodge was a great honor. The Elks were very active in the community and very generous. And the Elks Lodge becomes a place during the civil rights era where we start to see groups come together and plan activities. We also see a lot of musicians and athletes that come to the Elks Lodge. And when they come to Phoenix, that's where they visit. You know, the, the, the Masons were very important. And even the Elks Lodge too was quite important. My dad was a member of the Elks. Uh, he wasn't a mason. My, I had a my uncle was a mason, but uh, uh, yeah, those organizations were very important. Uh, the NAACP I wasn't a part of, but uh, I was able to to associate with the NAACP and CORE uh, during the protests and demonstrations in the '60s. Those were very very important. But 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 you know. I, I'm thinking I probably wasn't wasn't as mature, you know, in a lot of ways, and, until I was able to, to to go out and see see what the other other world was doing. The NAACP was a very big 
big part of the civil rights movement. Reverend Brooks on the South Side, Lincoln Ragsdale was a big civil rights proponent then. But I never did really march. You know, I you know I knew about the the protest and stuff, but I never did really really participate in it because I I just didn't think I was cut out for that at that time. So from 1950 to 1960, the population of African Americans in Phoenix quadrupled from about 5,000 people to over 20,000. Now part of this was because South Phoenix was finally annexed to the city of Phoenix. So during the 1950s, ending school segregation became an important focus for African Americans in Phoenix. And in 1952, a team of attorneys, Herb Finn, who was white, and Hazel Daniels, who was black, worked together to sue the Phoenix Union High School District to allow black students to attend Phoenix Union High School. The case went to court and ultimately was successful. And in 1953, Judge Fred C. Struckmeyer struck down segregation in high schools in Arizona. There was another case a few months later where segregation ended in elementary schools as well. And this was all before the 1954 case, Brown versus Board of Education, decided by the U.S. Supreme Court. So after segregation ended, Carver High School closed and black students became integrated with white students at the regular Phoenix Union High School, North High, and other schools throughout the state. After Carver High School closed in 1954, it was used as offices and as storage by the Phoenix Union High School District for many years. But finally, it was purchased by an alumni group, the Phoenix Monarchs Alumni Association, and it was converted to an African-American museum. And it still has that use today. Carver High School was also listed on the National Register of Historic Places and on the Phoenix Historic Property Register, and was recently upgraded to landmark status to show that it has exceptional significance to Phoenix history. I attended uh, Booker T. Washington school for kindergarten through, through the second grade. Um, after uh, the second grade at Booker T, it was a school right across from our house called Washington School, which was on 9th and Washington, across from the Macklin Hart Church. And in the third grade, I started going to Washington School, which later I found out was because it was the first year of integration, you know, uh, you know, well for me. But when I was going to grade school, I started out going to Booker T. Washington on 12th and Jefferson until uh, the second grade and when uh, integration kicked in in 1955, we started going to Longfellow School, which was we were the first class to integrate uh, at Longfellow School on uh, 18th Street and Adams. And that whole area before was was strictly whites, you know, and uh, that was in 1955. So by 1960, then they built projects over there right next to, to Longfellow. And, and uh, but anyway, things started to expand at that time. So even though the fight to end school segregation was won, there was still plenty of discrimination in other places, in housing and accommodations. Um, in order for African Americans to travel throughout the country, they needed to know where to go because they could not stay in the same places as whites. And so the Green Book became a popular resource for African Americans during this time. And it published the places where African Americans could go and stay and eat without being discriminated against. One of the places that African Americans could stay in Phoenix was the Swindle Tourist Inn. And it was a boarding house that was operated by the Swindle family at 10th Street in Washington. That building still exists today, although it's been converted to an office. It was listed on the National Register of Historic Places and Phoenix Historic Property Register for its significance. I, I gotta ask, 
you probably haven't felt this, but it's talked about all the time. If we go into a store, it seems like one of the salesmen is on the aisle we're on all the time. It's almost like we're being overseen while we're in there shopping. Man, that was a big joke. We knew when we walked in, and sometimes just for the fun of it, one person would go to men's clothing, one person would go to men's shoes, and all of a sudden, all the salesmen who were there for the rest of the customers were spread out and they couldn't do it all. But that's the things that we knew that indicated that we weren't equal, nor were we totally trusted. And that's the parts that hurt. That's the parts that hurt. My feeling is to tell you the honest to God truth was uh, I was I was kind of glad that if somebody didn't want me to eat with them, I was kind of glad that they was letting me know. You know, and I, that's just the way I looked at it. Maybe it was wrong, maybe it was backwards, but that's the way I felt about it. If somebody didn't want me around, I'm glad they was telling me they didn't want me around. And I would, you know, do like, you know, likewise. That's the way I felt. When I got old enough to have a vehicle, that's when I found out about driving while black. That's why I found out that if I went too far north, that the police would pull me over and ask me why I was there. That's when I learned that I was working at Dixon Electronics at night and they had called a curfew and I didn't get off till 1130 at night. So I got arrested, a, uh, I'd probably say 300 yards from my house. The police didn't even listen to me when I tried to explain I, I live right there. That's my house right there. And I still went to jail. The next morning, the, the judge brought me and said, why did you break curfew? I said, because I work at night at Dixon Electronics. Case dismissed. Things started to change in the 1960s as more people began to protest discrimination in housing, employment, and accommodations. In 1963, the Maricopa County chapter of the NAACP led a protest at Eastlake Park, and later that year, a thousand marchers marched from Eastlake Park to City Hall to present a list of grievances to Mayor Sam Mardian. Mayor Mardian's response was to adopt an equal employment creed for the community and to create a human relations commission. Protests continued the following year, and in June of 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King visits Phoenix. In July of 1964, the National Civil Rights Act was enacted. In that same month, the city of Phoenix passed an ordinance to make segregation of public facilities illegal. The following year, in April of 1965, the Arizona legislature passed its first civil rights laws. So throughout the civil rights era and really throughout Phoenix history, East Lake Park has played an important role. And it continues to play an important role today. Even today, we see protests and marches that originated at East Lake Park. In 1997, a civil rights memorial called Peace was installed at East Lake Park. And that memorial was to commemorate the uh, many activities that have taken place at the park and throughout our history um, involving the African American community. We see that East Lake Park becomes uh, an important place even today, where people gather to protest and to march to City Hall and to the state capitol. And we see that the protests and the challenges continue today. Much progress has been made over the last 100 plus years, but we see that the fight still continues. The uh, members of my church and all and the other elders that I spoke to from different churches and the, in, in the community as well, they're very, very proud of East Lake. They're very proud of the things that have been accomplished in East Lake as well as in the city of Phoenix. So, uh, and they pass that history on to some of us as well as their own children and grandchildren, some of them even their great grandchildren. So uh, things are progressing in East Lake. Uh, we're, we're trying our best to step out of 
uh, the, 19, the 20th century well into the 21st century. A lot of projects will be in that area that are already in the area and some that are coming. So uh, we're very proud of the history of how we have influenced the city of Phoenix through Eastlake and the surrounding uh, Garfield, Edison, uh, Booker T. It's, it's, we have just come together as one big family to, to make sure that things are progressing in the city of Phoenix uh, so that it is the better in the future for those generations that are coming behind us. I, 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 think, I think what you take away from it is that, you know, the contributions that African-Americans had uh, and, and actually the city, how the city has grown and how the city has, has taken in. You know, I came on the city council. Uh, I was a third African-American city council. Uh, actually, I was a fourth African-American city councilman on the city council. And you start to look at those contributions. And now you look at uh, South Phoenix, you look at the downtown area, uh, you look at some of the east side. African-Americans played a huge role and really starting that and really building that up where uh, African-Americans was trying to make sure they wanted to have equality and justice and have the same things that they had in any other community. And now that you see those things evolve around communities, you know, most people never go back in the history uh, to realize that African-Americans played a major role in the, the development and the leadership to develop those areas to make it is what it is today.